Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to another one of my lectures on relativity. There was a request in the comments asking, what about Tachyon's video you did? Why didn't you do the space-time diagram? I, I thought, wow, that's pretty important. So I'm going to do the space-time diagrams of the Tachyon's and Tacos video here. So let's quickly recap the events of that video. And if you haven't seen it, please go back and pause now and go take a look at it because it'll explain a lot more about what I'm about to talk about. All right, so now that you're back, we'll go over it. So two brothers, Damon and Travis, decide to try out their Tachyon anti-telephone to see if it'll help them with Damon's Cosmotaco business. Once again, we're going to be doing the Tolman paradox. The Tachyons and the anti-telephone machines are going to travel at 2.4 times the speed of light. As for Travis, he wants some tacos for that long trip to the very far away space station on Alpha Centauri. Travis's ship will pass by Damon's truck at 0.8, or rather 80% the speed of light. We'll call the point that Travis passes by the truck the zero point, or point of origin. And he's going to grab the bag of hot tacos and speed along his way. Now, it's very important to note that these tacos are resilient against instantaneous changes in velocity. That's probably a selling point, but something that will resist that much stress is probably something you don't want to eat. Something else might want to eat it, though. No matter what, Damon's an absolutely fantastic salesperson. It's also important to note that they can see each other in a telescope at any moment they choose. It's also important to note that the interior lighting allows anyone to see what's going on, and that's information about what's going on inside either the taco truck or the rocket goes out from each of them at the speed of light because it's light and exposes their actions to the universe. At 300 days on Damon's clock, he has a huge issue with the tacos. Damon sends a message to Travis saying, I ate some bad taco meat on my 300th day. Don't eat the meat. That message that he's about to send will travel by Tachyon Anti-Telephone 2.4 times the speed of light until it catches up to Travis, who's flying away at only 8 tenths the speed of light. However, before sending the message, Damon does look in his Super Taco Telescope and reads that Travis's clock and Travis's spaceship is only at 100 days. So he says to himself, Good, I can get the message to him before the meat expires on his 300th day so he won't eat the bad meat. According to Damon's calculations, the message will arrive on Travis's rocket on Damon's day 450. Now Damon knows and measures Travis's clock to be running slowly relative to his because of the special relativistic time dilation. Damon calculates that the message will arrive at Travis's spaceship when Travis's clock reads 270 days. Damon also calculates that he'll be able to see in his telescope Travis getting the message and being safe on his day 810. So Damon will see Travis get the message on day 810. Not on Travis's clock, but on his clock on day 810. That's going to be a long wait, but at least the message is going really fast by tachyons. All right, now let's see what Travis measures. On Travis's day 270, he will get a message on the Tachyon anti-telephone. Don't eat the meat. Travis looks quickly in his telescope back to Damon and sees that Damon's clock reads in his telescope only 90 days. And he gets a really bright idea. Travis calculates that if he sends a message now, it'll get there before Damon sends it, so he won't ever eat the meat. Travis then sends Damon the, the Tachyon anti-telephone and says, I got your message from day 300. Don't eat the bad taco meat. Just give it to the trans-dimensional mega donkeys that are always around the truck. Well, anyway, Travis's return message travels at 2.4 times the speed of light away from him, starting when Travis's clock says 270 days. Again, time dilation is symmetric. Therefore, Damon's clock, according to Travis, looks like it's running slow in a telescope and reads 90 days. Travis calculates that the message going to Damon will arrive at the taco truck when Damon's clock reads 243 days. This will spare Damon all the distress of the bad tacos on Damon's day 300. But this is 57 days before Damon sent the first message. Therefore, Travis has warned Damon about the bad taco meat two months before he even eats it. I wouldn't worry about the donkeys. They've seen this kind of thing before and they're always ready for tacos. When the speed of light is measured to be the same for all observers, then we use the Lorentz transformation to transform between two inertial reference frames. This cornerstone postulate of relativity combined with the postulate that all inertial reference frames are the same. 
By the same, we mean observers in any inter inertial reference frame measure all the same physical laws, including the speed of light, Newton's laws, and the behavior of tachyons and a tachyon anti-telephone. The Lorentz transformation preserves the constancy of the speed of light at the cost of the concept of simultaneity. There is no simultaneity between relatively moving observers in special relativity. It just doesn't exist. And as we've seen, faster than light travel makes it worse. These are the four equations that transform coordinates in a rest frame to a moving frame. On the right, we have two frames of reference. The red frame would be Travis's frame and the green frame is Damon's frame. Travis is the prime frame moving to the right at speed v. Here that's 80% the speed of light. Now let's look at the summary of a timeline. It's important to state right at the start that Damon and Travis completely agree that all events do indeed happen and that they occur with the timestamps that they're indicated. They agree on every aspect that has happened. They just cannot see how it happened. It's also important to note that every action taken by an observer has results that go forward in time from their in their frame of reference. Travis's tachyon message goes forward in time according to his observations. But the thing that made him send the message was Damon's first message. Damon sees something else. His first message clearly goes forward in time, but he started the conversation on his day 300. Both situations cannot be true because only one of them can happen first. This violates causality. It's important to note that both events of sending a message have a greater effect than just their message. Observers in other reference frames can watch it from different angles because everything is revealed by light. Now for the space-time diagrams. Let's start with Damon's rest frame. Damon's frame is in green and Travis's frame is in red. We only care about two coordinates in the space-time, time and movement to the left or right. Time is the vertical axis and is marked off in units of hundreds of days. The left-right direction is the horizontal axis and the unit of distance is hundreds of light days. For example, the location marked C has space-time coordinates in Damon's reference frame of about 1.67 days and 1.33 light days. It's important to note that forward in time means up in this, and any standard space-time diagram it does the same. A go, therefore, is down, and the future is up. Because light moves at one light day per day, the yellow lines denote the path of the beam, and they're therefore drawn at a 45-degree angle. This will be true in any reference frame, due to the fundamental postulate that the speed of light is a constant for all observers. Next, we know that Travis is moving away from Damon at 80% of the speed of light. A clock or anything else that doesn't move inside Travis's rocket will be measured by Damon to be on the top red line. Here, I'm assuming that the rocket is much smaller than a light day, which I think is a fair assumption. This means that the top red line is the time axis of the clock at rest in Travis's rest frame. The bottom red line is the x-axis, or distance axis, of Travis's moving rocket. We can show that this is the x-axis in Travis's frame by using the Lorentz transformation and setting t prime to zero and setting x prime to 100, 200, 300 light days, and so on. This will mark off the little ticks. The point C in Travis's coordinates would then be 100 days, and where the light ray crosses the bottom red line is 100 light days. I've marked off on the red axis units of 100 light days and 100 days accordingly. As you can see from Damon's perspective, Travis's clocks are moving slowly and are length contracted. This is the normal expectation from special relativity. Now how do we read this diagram? Damon is at rest in his taco truck frame. Accordingly, his world line simply goes vertically along the time axis, i.e. straight up. The important events he experiences are at time equals zero when Travis gets the tacos, next at time equals 300 when Damon gets sick and sends the message, and last on day 810 when Damon observes Travis get the message in an optical telescope. The blue arrow is the path of the tachyon message in spacetime. Notice that it has two important characteristics. First, it goes forward in time according to Damon. Next, because it goes faster than the speed of light, the slope of the line is steeper than both Travis's world line and a light ray. Therefore, Damon knows that in his future, the tachyon message will certainly catch up to Travis. It would also overtake the light ray too if it kept going. As you can see on the diagram, 
Travis receives the message when Damon's clock reads 450 days and Travis's clock reads 270 days. This is all good, according to Damon. Also, there's no issue according to Travis either. He does get a message when his clock reads 270 days. Now, let's shift over to look at the situation in Travis's inertial frame on the rocket. Now the axes are red to reflect that we're in Travis's frame. Damon's taco truck is receding at 80% the speed of light and so therefore is tilted to the left. The relevant events for Travis are that he picks up the tacos at time zero. At his time, 270 days, he gets a tacky on message and immediately sends a response. And using his telescope on day 279, Travis will see Damon get his message. Travis's tacky on message arrives at Damon's truck on Travis's day 405. Damon's coordinates, which are the dots on the green lines, are marked in units again of 100 light days and 100 days. You should be able to see the problem pretty clearly. It's also important that when Travis sent the message, he first checked and saw his telescope and saw that Damon's clock did read 90 days. This means, according to Travis's measurements, Damon will get the message in both Travis's future and Damon's future, according to Travis. Travis's tachyon message went forward in time, according to him. But let's look more closely at that purple dot at Damon's time 300 and Travis's time 500. As you can see from this diagram, the blue arrow, which is Damon's first tachyon message, well, wait a second. Damon's first tachyon message came from Travis's future. The blue arrow goes from upper left to lower right. It's pointed down into the right. The down direction means backward in time, according to Travis, which is what he must conclude happened if Damon put in a truthful timestamp in his first message. But notice something about, odd about the setup. Normally, we'd look at this diagram and say the blue line looks like in Travis's frame that he sent the message to Damon and it went a bit slower than the message indicated by the red line. It's almost like he had two anti-telephones and set on different transmission speeds. Slightly confusing to think about, but in that way, both Damon and Travis can be thought of sending the first message. Most importantly, Damon and Travis can completely agree that all the events that transpired did in fact transpire. They don't disagree on anything. Damon sent the message on his day 300. Travis got a message and responded on day 270. Damon got a response to his message on day 243. They can agree that all the events as it happened, as it were, but the ordering is wrong because as soon as Damon gets the message in 243 days, he says, wow, there's going to be some bad meat. I'm not going to eat it. So he's going to throw it out the airlock and the transmensional mega donkeys are going to eat it. And so therefore he will never send the message 57 days later because he will never get sick. And that stops the conversation from ever happening. That's a causality violation. Essentially, this transfer of information back and forth, this faster than light two-week conversation will lead to a causality violation. It's called the Tolman Paradox, and since he published it in about 1917. Albert Einstein also noted this in 1907, and I've used Gregory Brenford's 1970 name, the tachyonic anti-telephone, in this discussion. All these and other researchers and intrepid physics undergraduates have known about this for a long time, and there's nothing you can do about this paradox. Any kind of conversation back and forth using messaging that goes faster than the speed of light, whether it's tachyons or anything else, will get you a causality violation. But this isn't the worst news for tachyon signals. Dr. Moses Feingold at New Jersey Institute of Technology proposed in 2017 and then revised it in May 2022 that you could make the two observers, Damon and Travis, not even agree about the events that transpired. There's a link to this paper in the description. With any allowed interaction with matter that would create some kind of tachyon receiver or your transmitter, he found that you could construct a paradox out of a tachyon by either being blocked or not blocked from traversing from one inertial reference frame to another by some intermediate actor, say a megadonkey. Dr. Feingold's proof shows that you can violate not just the time ordering of events, like above, like I described before, but what events have actually occurred. For example, suppose there's a trans-dimensional megadonkey between Damon and Travis. It might choose or not to block the single tachyon, just one tachyon, that Travis is trying to send. 
if the donkey is absolutely between them and Travis sends a single tachyon to Damon, let's see what happens. On its way, let's say the donkey kicks the tachyon. According to Travis, the tachyon never makes it to Damon. Travis will fully expect that Damon will agree that Travis sent something, perhaps noting the huge recoil of Travis's rocket, and that the donkey happily kicked some tachyon because it turned a lovely shade of char chartreuse rather than its usual fuchsia. But here's the thing. Damon would always see the tachyon from Travis coming in time reversed. As such, the single tachyon can rightly be thought of as having been emitted by Damon and that the donkey kicked his tachyon. This is because, according to Damon, the proper time order is that he sends the tachyon, the donkey kicks it or not, and Travis receives it or not. If the donkey did indeed kick the tachyon, then, according to Damon, he sent it. So this terrible situation is now much worse. Either Damon or Travis disagree on the time ordering of the departure and arrival of a single tachyon, or Damon and Travis disagree fundamentally on who sent the one tachyon. The capricious interloper donkey between them will ensure that you will either get a causality violation or a factual violation. I'll talk about more of this in a later video if you like. Just leave some comments about it and I'll do a subsequent video just about this one paper. The net result of all this is that there's just no winning. There's absolutely no winning. There's no safe way to allow all the laws of physics, including a law of physics that includes tachyons and physical tachyon detectors and emitters in it. A conversation will lead to a causality violation and a one-way message will eventually lead to a factual violation. That doesn't mean that serious researchers haven't given up. Though there's nothing notable yet, in 2022, Dr. Robert Ehrlich at George Mason University summarized the long event to, to effort to find tachyons. There is no currently smoking gun evidence today that says tachyons do exist. Even though people have been searching for tachyons for over 50 years, they have never found them. The entire content of my video is also based on classical relativity and doesn't take into account some of the interesting implications of quantum mechanics. Dr. Ehrlich has researched tachyons since the 1990s and has created a model of neutrinos as tachyons that very importantly, can be falsified by the discovery of a nearby Milky Way supernova. This falsifiability is a hallmark of good science. Tachyons are generally considered to not exist, and a young physicist would be foolhardy to embark on such a path of research. Dr. Ehrlich, however, is a well-established faculty member at a university and has chosen to work in an area that, after more than 20 years of active research, would give a null result. And he's doing this at the close of his career. This is extraordinarily noble, because if no one had ever done this work, then the question would always be begged, do tachyons actually exist? Can we detect them if they do? It's fantastic that he's doing it. We might see or might not see the event. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I hope you'll click the like button and subscribe. And if you haven't seen my lecture series on classical relativity, please check it out in the links below. Finally, you can watch my entire introductory astronomy course online here on YouTube and get the same material that you'd get at any major university taking an undergraduate astronomy course. Talk to you later.